I've gone over on Monday kind of the basics of membrane filtration. Um, let's just do a quick review um, and then I'll focus on the example problems um, just to kind of give some give some context to what we're looking at. So when we're talking about membrane filtration, we really break that down into four different groups from microfiltration, which is the largest pore size, to reverse osmosis, which is the smallest pore size. And we typically divide these into two categories of pressure-driven systems and sieving. Now, all of these systems require pressure. The difference is that with reverse osmosis and nanofiltration, we're typically looking at the osmotic pressure difference between the permeate and the feed. So let's just kind of stop there with some definitions. Okay. So we have a membrane filtration system. We're looking at passing water across some membrane. Anybody been backpacking and you've taking, taken a backpacking filter with you on a trip? Yes, no? Never with a filter, okay. Nice thing about filters, okay. Um, most people don't like the um, taste um, of chlorine or the iodine tablet. So a lot of people will use um, filters. That's what we use. The other thing is, is you don't have to wait the time for disinfection that you do with chlorine tablets. So, and the problem thinking about kind of off topic, UV stores, we've talked about UV. And if the water's turbid, how does that impact the efficacy of the UV straw? It's going to decrease the efficacy. So, so the membrane filters typically are ceramic filters. And the water is passing across the filter. And the idea is that the filter captures the protozoans, mainly bacteria, some bacteria, actually will capture bacteria and some viruses. Um, if you're dealing with a water that potentially contaminated with viruses, you wanna actually also disinfect with either chlorine or UV. But what we see is we have with these filters, and this is everything from a backpacking filter to the most complex RO filter in a treatment plant. We have what we refer to as the permeate stream or the product water. And we have the reject stream or the concentrate. And those terms are used interchangeably. So all of them operate in this way. They also operate in either a cross flow or a dead end mode. Okay. Now, your backpacking filter operates in a dead end mode. The filter that you use in the lab operates in a dead end mode. So you've got water, it's flowing through <clears throat> across that membrane and basically, all of the water flows through the membrane. To cross flow, you have a kind of essentially the way I've shown it here. You have water flowing per <clears throat> parallel to the membrane surface. Some will flow across the membrane. So it's basically per perpendicular to the membrane. 
and your reject stream flows, stays parallel, okay, and doesn't flow. Okay, so if we kind of think about it, here's our membrane surface. And I'm drawing this with a tubular membrane. But let's say we've got water flowing into the membrane. The, the walls of the membrane serve as our sir. Uh, uh, well, the walls of the unit serve as our membrane okay, surface. So our permeate flows across through that surface and our reject stream flows out the other side. So just simplest way, think of it that way. So this would be a cross flow. Now, the challenge with membrane filtration is twofold. One, the pressure, okay? We need to have very high pressures in order to achieve reverse osmosis where we're looking at removing the ions from the water. Okay, backpacking filter, you can push the water through by hand. You can hang the water, your, the, <clears throat> um, your collection vessel from a tree and have the membrane close to the ground. So you're using static head. Okay. That's sufficient for, for a microfilter or a what we call a coarse ultra filter. So in terms of pore size, pore size is closer to that of a microfilter. So pressure is going to play a very significant role. The concentration of our feed stream is going to play a significant role. So for instance, if we're looking at, let's say, sea, salt water, seawater, okay, versus a um, brine solution, so more saline solution. So typically we're talking about, let's say 35,000 milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids. Let's say we're at about 5,000 milligrams per liter. And let's say we're, have we got water that we, let's say this is reuse and we've got a thousand milligrams per liter of TDS. Now, there's an example from Monday where, where I calculate the osmotic pressure. Okay. <clears throat> so we could calculate the osmotic pressure of each of these solutions. Which ones will have the highest osmotic pressure? So your salt water Exactly. Seawater is going to have the highest osmotic pressure, which means that if okay, what we refer to is the transmembrane pressure. So normally, and normally in turn, if you have, if we're looking at osmosis, okay, and what you see here is two solutions, okay? Um, think of this as having a, we've got a membrane in between. So, and the, there's a video in the recorded lecture where they actually look at a sol sugar solution with molasses, okay? But we can think about this here. So we've got a solution We've got a concentrated solution here. So this is our concentrated solution in the middle. And we've got a dilute solution here. And we have a semi-permeable membrane. So this 
the membrane is permeable to water, but not permeable to the chemicals that to our solute in this concentrated solution. Okay. So we've this we've got a so we've got the semi-permeable membrane. We take this dialysis bag, okay? With the semi-permeable membrane, we put in a concentrated solution. What happens over time? So over time, okay. So it's diluted. Which way? So the concentrated solution's diluted, right? Okay. So our bag is going to expand. Why? Because it's going to fill with water in order to dilute that concentrated solution. And that's what's shown here. So we have a flux of water towards the more concentrated solution. Reverse osmosis, we're trying to achieve the opposite. We start with a concentrated solution and we're trying, we wanna push water across the membrane to the dilute side. In order to do that, we have to apply a pressure and this pressure has to exceed the difference in the osmotic pressure from this side of the membrane and the permeate side of the membrane. So if you look at Monday's lecture, I do a calculation where we calculate that pressure, the osmotic pressure. Okay. The other thing to remember, can, a, can a osmosis be done without pressure? Really good question. It's actually the million dollar question right now. Um, as you can imagine, if you're dealing with salt water and desalination, you're dealing with real, very high pressures. Therefore, it's expensive and it's highly energy intensive. So there's what they call forward osmosis. And I'm not gonna talk a lot of that. I'm not gonna really talk about it but basically it's a newer process where instead of pressure, an attempt is used, an attempt is made to use the concentration gradient. So you end up with this really concentrated solution. Well, can you use the concentrated, the concentration gradient between that concentrate and your feed solution in order to essentially, I call it power, okay? Um, the, osmo the essentially reverse osmosis process. That's the only attempt that I know that's done where it's basically instead of a pressure gradient, it's a concentration gradient that's being used to try and achieve desalination. Um, we've, the only other thing that's been done is to really use solar power and that, but again, you're still using pressure. You're just using solar energy to try and power the pumps to generate the pressure. It's a really good question. So the flux of water is equal to a coefficient of water permeation. And that is membrane specific. Okay. And that's a function of this transmembrane pressure. So it's the pressure across your membrane and the difference in the osmotic pressure of the solutions in the feed solution and the permeate. One of the things to, to recognize okay, with 
all of these processes, and especially reverse osmosis and nanofiltration, is that you're going to have some flux of salt. And that flux of salt is dependent on the diffusivity of the solute. So if we look at, for instance, um, lithium, sodium, and potassium, okay. diffusivity is a function of molecular weight. So the diffusivity will decrease as molecular weight increases. So if we're looking at these three salts, molecular weight increases, which means the diffusivity is greatest for lithium. So what does that mean if we're looking at desalinating a water that has these three ions present, what does that mean in, in terms of the flux? So if the flux of the salt across the membrane is a function of the diffusivity. So which of these three ions are you likely to see the greatest flux across the membrane? Lithium, okay, exactly. Okay, what is flux? So flux is just, here's our membrane. And we have water passing through. Okay, we can talk about flux of water, which is what we have here. So it's the flow rate. But it's notice it's given here in typically in kilomoles or mass per unit area of membrane per time. Okay. Or it can be a volumetric flux for water. For salt, it's typically mass, often as, for instance, kilograms again, so it's the kilograms of salt per area of membrane per time. Okay. So <clears throat> consequently, what you're going to see okay, is that your flux is greatest for your lower molecular weight ions. Or compounds. Okay. It's also a function of the concentration gradient across the membrane. And a salt permeation coefficient or a mass transfer coefficient <clears throat> across the membrane. And that's, this is going to be membrane specific. So let's go through a couple examples kind of working through <clears throat> some really basic design designs of uh, concepts for membrane systems. Typically, if you're designing a membrane system, you're going to work with the supplier, and you're also going to use their software. Okay. Their software will take into account the ionic composition. It will take into account pH. It will take into account temperature. Um, and it will also typically tell you where you're going to have problems. For instance, um, if the concentrations of your ions are so great, you're going to get precipitation at the membrane surface. 
So you may need to make some modifications, for instance, add chemicals for that. And typically, these models will actually assist and provide you that type of information. But so what we're doing here really are some just really high level conceptual understanding um, of membrane systems. So we have a high pressure RO system and it's being evaluated for producing pure water from seawater. It will be blended with seawater for a drinking water supply. Why? Because otherwise the total dissolved solids is essentially zero. You've stripped out everything from the water and it's highly corrosive. So by blending it, we can produce a water with um, that is more stable uh, and then can be distributed. And you're asked to make an order of magnitude estimate of the requir required pressure differential or transmembrane pressure sorry, if the difference in osmotic pressure must be 2,500 kilopascals. You're given a permeation constant or mass transfer coefficient for the water flux and you are given a volumetric flux. So we're looking for the delta pressure or the transmembrane pressure. We're told that the change in osmotic pressure from the feed solu solution and the permeate is 2,500 kilopascals. And this is nine, six point eight nine times ten to the minus four meters cubed of water per day per meter squared of membrane per kilopascal. Okay. And the flux of water is equal to Kw times the difference between our transmembrane pressure and our osmotic pressure differential. So we need to make sure we've got the same units. We've got 170 liters per hour per meter squared. We're going to put everything in days because we've got days here. So we have 24 hours per day hours cancel, and we have meters cubed, so we'll convert. We have a thousand liters per meter cubed, and that is equal to 6.89 times 10 to the minus four meters cubed per day per meter squared of membrane surface per kilopascal we're looking for the transmembrane pressure. And we were told that the osmotic pressure different, dif differential must be 2,500 kilopascals. So the transmembrane pressure is roughly 8,420 kilopascals or about 1,200 PSI. So we're talking extremely high pressures. These membranes also have to be able to withstand these pressures. If you look at the recorded video, um, I've got in that some shorter videos looking at these type of membranes and uh, to give you some sense of the type of spacing, okay, that, and construction of these membranes that are necessary in order to achieve these pressures or to withstand these pressures. Okay. 
you then asked to estimate the mass flux of the solute for this previous problem if the influent concentration is 3,500 milligrams per liter, we'll set the effluent concentration at zero, and you're given a mass transfer coefficient for the solute flux of 6.14 times 10 to the minus four meters per hour. So the equation we use is the flux of salt is equal to this permeation constant times the pressure differential. And that is equal to 6.14 times 10 to the minus four meters per hour times 35,000 minus zero. And then we'll convert because we've asked for kilo, <clears throat> kilograms. So this is milligrams per liter. 10 to the 6 milligrams per kilogram. So milligrams cancel. And we have 1,000 liters per meter cubed. So liters cancel. And we've got meters and meters cubed. So this becomes meters squared. And we've got. Um, I canceled hours, I shouldn't have. Um, we have 24 hours per day, and now hours cancel. Okay, so we've got kilograms per meter squared per day. And if we multiply, this is 0.52. Okay. So that is the flux of salt. So there's roughly a half a kilogram of salt passing through the membrane for every square meter of membrane surface per day. The other two terms that we use are recovery and rejection. So the recovery is your permeate flow divided by your feed flow. And these will range somewhere between, typically for an RO system, about 35% to 75%. May get some height with some newer um, membrane systems, you may get higher recoveries, but not much higher than about 75% which means that you're going to have to treat much more water than you're actually, in order to produce sufficient amount of water, okay? We also talk about rejection. So rejection, this recovery deals with the water, rejection with the salts. So <clears throat> just kind of to keep those terms um, straight, it's really important. Let's look at a example where we deal with, we have to deal with recovery. We're not gonna look at rejection at this point. We'll just look at recovery. Now, again, remember what you're dealing with is we have a feed solution. We have a permeate, and we have our reject stream. Okay. This here is shown as it's a two-stage array. Why? Because we're going to take the reject stream, and we're going to treat that a second time. So eventually what we're looking at doing, think of it as really squeezing out as much water as you possibly can. So here's our product. We again produce 
product water from that second stage. And we have reject. Now that reject stream we have to deal with. That becomes a residual. It's actually one of the biggest problems in reverse osmosis systems because this is a highly concentrated solution and disposing of it isn't trivial. Simply discharging it into a body of water can change the salinity of that body of water, can change the ecosystem. So there's real debate in terms of what to do with this reject stream. Okay, so we have a situation where you're told that you have a membrane system. And think of it now just as a system. Okay. And it is rated at 65% recovery. And you're told that the flow rates can be between 850 and 1300 cubic meters per day. You're asked to design an array that will yield at least 2,000 meters cubed per day of pure water. And you want a total recovery of greater than 50%. So we've got this membrane system. Draw it this way. This is our feed. We have a product water, and we have a reject stream. Okay. And you're told that we can use somewhere between 850 cubic meters per day and 1,300 cubic meters per day. And total, we have to produce at least 2,000 cubic meters per day of pure water. Okay. Now, so let's kind of think about this here. We'll start with 1,000. So we start with 1,000 cubic meters per day. What is our flow rate? in the product water. Okay, this is what I wanna know. If I have, if I'm feeding a thousand cubic meters per day and I have a 35% recovery, what is Q product? So I have 35% recovery. It's 35, it's 350. So only getting out 350. If I were to just operate a system like this, I need to produce a total of 2,000. How many membrane systems do I need? So I need to produce at least... 2,000, okay, I need six, okay? So 3,500, sorry, uh, 350 times six. I'm actually doing the math here because I'm slightly changing the problem. Okay, so that equals 2,280 meters cubed per day. I've met this requirement here. Have I met the second requirement? I haven't. I have 35% recovery. So I've met the first requirement, but not the second. So what do I do in order to achieve that 50% or at, great, at least 50% recovery. What can I do? I can use a two stage, okay? So increasing 
it could increase the permeant flux, but that's really a function of your membrane. So remember, that's a function of KW. And so I could pick a different membrane, and perhaps with a different membrane, I could achieve that 50%. Okay. Slowing down the flow rate isn't going to increase the recovery, because remember, your recovery is a fun, or your flux is going to be a function of your pressure differential, so your transmembrane pressure, and the difference in the osmotic pressure. What I can do is use a two-stage system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Same thing, okay? Let's start with the thousand. If 350 meters per day is my product water. My reject is 650. So if I take part, or I take this flow here, and I put this through a second membrane, I am now going to get, so if I take the 650 from here, I will get 227.5 meters cubed per day. So what am I doing? Essentially kind of squeezing out extra water. If I instead have four membranes here. Okay. Each of these membranes are treating a thousand cubic meters per day. Okay. Each of them produces 350 cubic meters per day. So a reject stream from each of these is 650. Okay. Now, if I combine all of this flow here to one, and now I treat with three units. Okay, still have a membrane. So now, <clears throat> I'm going to take, okay, so I've got 650, and this is going to produce 227.5. And actually, let's change back to red, because that's what I used before. So this was our, so what I've produced here is if I add up what I've produced in stage one, it's 1,400. If I add up what I've produced in stage two, it's 910 cubic meters per day. So if I add up both of those, that is 2,300 cubic meters per day. So this is what I'm producing. I've started with 4,000, and that exceeds that 50%. Okay, so what I've done here is, like I said, essentially squeezed out enough water. If I just had a single array, stage one, I need six, units, six systems, think of it as six systems, okay? And those systems are only producing water or recovering 35% of the water. So by using a two-stage system, I can increase the recovery. Now I could actually increase it further by making a three-stage system in which case I could take 
the permeates here, and I can treat that. Now, the problem is, is my flow keeps decreasing, but my concentration keeps increasing. So my delta P or delta pi, so delta the osmotic pressure is going to increase significantly from stage one to stage two to stage three, which means my transmembrane pressure also has to increase. So that's the disadvantage of this system. Any questions? And think of these as a system um, because typically what you have is you have what we call a vessel and then you have membranes inside that vessel. So you may have up to six membrane units or elements inside this vessel, but this whole thing here actually is essentially what we're describing right here. So these tend to be very, because of the pressures, because of the low flux across this membrane, we need a lot of these. It'll really help to watch the recorded lecture to give you a better sense of what these systems really look like.